nature not I'm not afraid to admit I'm wild about the wild things and I'm proud of it I'm just a simple case open and shut no doubt about it I'm a nature nut today we'll go bird watching tomorrow we'll catch toads the next day we'll take photographs of bugs along the road I never get the feeling that I'm in a rut that's why I'm a nature nut well I'm a nature nut I'm not afraid to admit I'm wild about the wild things and I'm proud of it I'm just a simple case open and shut no doubt about it I'm a nature nut hello there nature nuts how are you well you know today we're going to talk about one of my favorite subjects but before we even get started I want to warn you there's a matter of confusion that I want to clear up. Confusion about animal names. The animals I'm going to talk about today, well, let's first of all start by orienting ourselves. Here's the world. There's my house right about there. And if we look at it in more detail, the critters I'm talking about do not live here on this continent. That's, of course, the pyramids up there. Nope. Wash that right out of your mind. That's not the group to which I'm going to refer. Not the ones that you might find along this uh, southern border here. There's the Taj Mahal, just so you know where you're looking there. And of course, we are also utterly unconcerned with those representatives of the group to which we do not want to refer, which live in that region there, the southern regions, and that's, uh, that's the Vatican, just so you know what we're looking at. Nope, instead, what I want to talk about are those very, very lovely critters that inhabit this area, this area, and even this area here. How about that, eh? Hmm, there's where we are right now. So, that's, uh, whoa, hey, that's uh, taped to the easel. Pardon me. Now, these are the ones that I want you to completely forget about. The true chameleon lizards of the old world. Forget about their little turreted eyes, their peculiar feet, their curly tails. Just brush them right out of your mind. Put them aside. Get them out of your hair. Instead, we're going to concentrate on the ones that were formerly called American chameleons, but are more properly known as anole lizards. Superb little critter. So I'm gonna just give a little tip of the hat to this fella. Thanks for your help. I'm all rigged up, and I'm ready to go looking for anole lizards. Animals are much more slender, much more speedy, much more agile than chameleons. Now there's one right here. There we go. A beautiful little brown anole. Anoles were originally considered part of the iguana lizard family, but they are now in a family of their own, the Polycridae. Now this is an anole tank. And this is the right kind of setup to keep your anoles healthy. To start with, it's a big, big aquarium. It's a 52 gallon aquarium. That's enough space for eight. I've got eight of these guys in here. They do get into a few little territorial fights now and again, but in general, they can get along. They can stay out of each other's way and, uh, and they seem to like all that space to run around in. And I've got a full-length, full-spectrum fluorescent tube here. That gives them all the ultraviolet light they need to stay healthy. I'll just put it down. But it doesn't give them any heat. So I added a floodlight, and now they're fine. They'll use the entire tank, and it's nice and warm. Then you have to think about water. Now, if you're an animal, for some reason, they're little animal brains, they don't recognize water when it's just standing stagnant in a bowl, and so they often won't drink from a bowl. So instead, I have a little pond with a pump that pumps the water through this lovely uh, bamboo waterfall. They see the rippling water in the pond, and that's where they drink. The next thing, of course, is the, is the plants. These are real plants, and they're in pots, and the pots have been set in the cork, or not the cork, but the bark, chips at the bottom of the tank and the animals really like the real plants especially the green animals get right up on the plants it gives them a three-dimensional playground they can stay out of each other's way they can crawl around on there 
And the only thing you have to remember, of course, is to water the plants every day because if you don't, they start looking like this poor little fern here. It's not looking that good. I'm just gonna take the lid off to water the plants. Otherwise, I start banging into the heat lamps. And that's about all you have to remember. The basics of animal care, space, heat, water, light, and plants. Schwap! Oh man, there's one getting out here. That's another thing you should remember. Always leave the lid on. They're really good at escaping. I want to read you a little bit from this book because I think this is beautiful. This is a timeless classic of the pet literature. It's been in print since 1957. Here we go, from Mervyn F. Roberts. Generally, in pet books of this sort, the author describes the animal in terms of its usefulness to mankind. Dogs offer protection. Cats catch mice. Pigeons carry messages. Rabbits can be eaten. Mice are useful in scientific study. But what can a chameleon do? Not much of anything useful. About all that can be said for its usefulness is that it can catch a few flies a day, but a 10 cent fly swatter is cheaper and quicker. 10-year-old museum curators and zoo directors often argue that since chameleons will eat spiders and the dangerous black widow is an edible spider, it would be well to have a chameleon or two about the house to control black widows. The trouble with this line of reasoning is that distraught parents of 10-year-old curators, directors, and menagerie proprietors often find that this all somehow leads to the establishment of a black widow spider hatchery. This digression is of an autobiographical nature and should serve to prove that not everything small boys play with is guaranteed 100% fatal. What it narrows down to is this. When you want a chameleon, you just plain want a chameleon. Period. Timeless Wisdom from Mervyn F. Roberts. Mealworms used to be the standard food for animals, but they are too hard-shelled and crunchy to provide a healthy diet. Okay, well now we're gonna feed our animals, and uh, in nature they eat insects and flies, things like that. Flies are insects, that's what we're gonna feed them too. And I've got some flies here. I raised them from fishing maggots. If you buy fishing maggots, you don't go fishing for a while, you get flies. But before you put them in, of course, they've been buzzing around in this cage, I have to anesthetize them. So, usually I put them in the refrigerator, that slows them down. I get in trouble when I do that, so today I brought them outside. You can imagine how fun this is when they're not out cold, so to speak. Okay. Oh yeah, they recognize them. Usually with lizards, they cue in on movement but once they get to know a particular sort of food, they'll recognize it even if it's not moving or if it's moving very slowly. So they know that they're looking at a bunch of tasty little blue bottle flies here and that green animal's got his eye on the meal. Oh, and the little female got to it first. Ooh, you can see how much she enjoys it too, smacking her lips and they, uh, they don't chew the food, but they do crunch it up because after all, you don't want something half the size of your head remaining alive in your stomach. Very bad, very bad indeed. Oh, and that little guy got, uh, he got deked out a second time. I was having a rough time at the old food trough today. Oh, they do seem to love them though. They love those little blue bottle flies. 
but it's not a complete diet for an anole lizard. They have to get all the basic anole food groups, so we're just going to consider this the first course of their three-course meal. The second course is crickets. I buy them at the pet store, and I don't just feed them straight crickets. I dust them first with a little bit of vitamin and mineral powder. I think they, uh, they look at it as a sort of an exotic spice, you know, a little bit of salt and pepper and stuff from the uh, tropical islands and so on. I don't know. They seem to like it though. They don't mind it at all. And I'll just drop these crickets down here. Have some crickets there, guys. All right. Some people pinch the back legs, the jumping legs off the crickets before they feed them, but these are fairly small crickets, so the legs are not that big and uh, spiny and difficult to digest, so I don't bother doing that. Oh, and that little female green animal, she's really getting her share of the food here today, isn't she? I guess she needs to get lots of nutrition to uh, produce those eggs of hers. Anyway, crickets, the second course of your basic animal three-course meal. And now for a little bit of dessert, eh? Today we have baby food d'abricot, or as we say in English, apricot baby food. We have a baby at home now, beautiful little guy, I'll show him to you sometime, but uh, he's too small for this, so we feed it to the lizards instead, and they really like it. Watch this. that uh, an insect-eating lizard wouldn't eat this sort of thing, but I guess in nature they take a bit of overripe fruit, some uh, flower nectar from time to time. It rounds out their nutritional requirements. They seem to really like it. That little guy got right in there, lapping it up like a little puppy. No wonder they look so healthy. Makes me feel good too. Let's talk about animal color displays, flash color displays that come out of nowhere. Coloration that you don't usually see on an animal, but that it can produce at a moment's notice to startle or to send a signal to its neighbors. Now there are lots of examples in the animal world. Even the human smile is a kind of a flash display. You flash your pearly whites at your neighbor. Hey there, and you send them a special message. Hi! It's a flash. One minute it's there, next minute it's not. With animals, the big flash display is the dewlap. It's also called the throat fan, and it's a big colorful fan of skin that extends out from the throat, especially in males. Usually they do a little bit of push-up stuff first, and then out comes that fan. Uh, very beautiful. The message is a territorial message or a courtship message. And uh, it's an interesting thing. It's held out by a, a rod of cartilage. Cartilage is the flexible stuff in your ears and your nose. Uh, their cartilage that holds the dewlap is part of the hyoid apparatus. Weird thing, we don't have a hyoid apparatus in our throat. There's no hyoid apparatus in there. What you just saw is the uh, equivalent cartilage in the human larynx, the voice box, the Adam's apple. And yeah, it's kind of interesting. Evolution went two different directions. Animals got a dewlap. We got to talk. What the heck, pretty good trade-off if you ask me. Anyway, let me show you how it works. The uh, rod of cartilage is kind of like a rod of flexible metal. I'm going to put on my homemade animal puppet here. I'll just rig up the hyoid apparatus. And you can make one of these at home. You need a red nylon stocking. Very embarrassing thing to go buy, I find. And a sock with a, with a slit in it and a couple of plastic eyes. All right, if you get it looking right, then it looks just like a lizard. There we go, a little animal. Basking in the sun, looking around. Spotting for food, 
sees a neighbor, wants to send a little doolab message. How about that? A couple of push-ups. Some lizards have a dewlap that is simply a flap of skin without the cartilage rod that controls the dewlap in animals. I know there's so many different kinds of animals, it would be foolish to try to go into any detail, but I do want you to know about two species, the brown and the green. Let's start with the green. Now here's one here, and as you can see, it's brown. If you watch this show at all, you know that I go nuts with animal names, especially when they're like this. Well, these brownies kind of turn in green a little bit. That's what they do. It's kind of like I'm turning a bit red. Just a sec, I'll catch you back up top. Now the green anole, it's also called the Carolina anole, and uh, you know, the way you recognize them, completely ignore their color. They can be green or brown or anything in between. Some of them are even blue. The way you recognize them is that they are always rather simple and elegant in their color pattern. Sometimes they have a little light squiggly line down the back. Now we've seen quite a few along here, and sometimes they're just one single plain color. The blue ones, they're very interesting. And you know, actually that reminds me, let me tell you how they change color. Normally they would be green, and the green color comes both from a yellow pigment, there's a yellow pigment right in the skin, and from the fact that there are little tiny particles in the skin that scatter the light and give it a blue tint. So blue and yellow gives green. Then they have little pigment granules in the skin, and they can move those closer to the surface to make the skin darker. That's when it turns brown. When the yellow pigment is absent, they're blue. Those are the rare ones. Oh, I'd love to see a blue one. Never seen a blue one. Uh, maybe there's one under this bench again. Who knows? And a lano was running up the pole, and a merry old soul was he. He lived in the glades where he turned different shades from green to brown and brown to green. He was a green and old and very droll. He loved to lie in the sun. On a leafy leaf, he'd be the chief from the morning till the day is done. That old and old, he took a stroll through the land of the gator and the salmon. Old. And while he made his glade patrol, he would listen to the sound of the Oreo. When he's green or tan, he's quite a man. Oh, look, his scarlet doolet. He'll spar with the guys despite his size and watches out for predators if he's wise. That old and old, he ain't no mole. You'll never see him down in a hole. Bright sunshine makes him feel real fine in the winter, spring, or summer time. Take a good old look at the old and old. In the side of his head, he has a tiny hole. Oh dear, who stole his ear a troll? Did he ever get to hear a bit of rock and roll? An old and old was running up the pole, and a merry old soul was he. He lived in the glades where he turned different shades from green to brown and brown to green. Oh, he's brown. And then to green. I think he's turning brown. And back to green. Is he, is he green? And then to brown. <laughs> The other species of anole that I want you to be able to recognize is the brown anole. And brown anoles, they don't live in quite the same habitats as green anoles. They don't like getting up in the leafy vegetation. They like being on the ground or on exposed tree trunks near the ground. This mangrove forest and the path leading through it, it's just about perfect. Uh-huh. Well, that was easy, exactly. Is that a camouflaged animal or what? It's a perfectly brown, brown animal. All right, don't worry, this is not a disco scene. It's time for another embarrassing reminiscence from my childhood. I remember sneaking around the neighborhood, 
pretending that I had been bitten by a radioactive animal lizard. I had gained that lizard's powers. I became Chameleon Guy. I was able to change colors from brown to green, green to brown. Suddenly, he's blue, he's yellow, whatever it takes. I was able to run really fast. Those lizards, they can run really fast. But, you know, at that point, I kind of ran out of lizard powers that I was able to use. I really wanted to be able to walk straight up walls, though. You know how they can do that? They can even walk up glass. It's amazing. I thought their little feet were suction cups back then. That's not the way it works at all. They're really kind of like little tiny spoons, and they stick to the glass the same way a spoon will stick to your nose. If your nose is clean, and your technique is good. The surest way to identify most animals is to note the color and shape of their extended dewlap. You know, an animal really isn't a lizard that you can handle easily. If they're healthy, they're very fast, very agile, and despite the fact that this one is behaving beautifully for me right now, boy, if they're warm enough, they're off like a shot, and you'll never get them back. Good looking little guy. Have a seat there. You keep an eye on him for me. I noticed the other day that you can buy lizard leashes in the pet store. They look like this. Their front legs are supposed to fit through these little holes. Then you cinch it up and put this big wrecking ball thing up against their back. It doesn't look particularly comfortable to me and I doubt that it's easy to get them on the lizard. My assistant tells me that, ooh, I can feel it down the middle of my back there. My assistant tells me that she put one on her iguana and it ripped its off, ripped it off its own body. So pardon me, my mind is elsewhere right now, along with my animal. Anyway, um, I better deal with this. We'll see you again next time. I hope you're a nature nut, because I am one too. You see it is on my back? Where'd it go? Ladies and gentlemen, five oh, minutes. Territory. Five like minutes to, to the great dewlap. Wait to find bugs to eat. Mmm, how pleasant. Then along came Greeny the animal. Oh, what a wonderful place this is to be. I love the bugs and the scenery. I think I'll stay and sun myself. Hey! Uh, who are you? Who are you? I, I'm Brownie the Animal. This is my territory. Well, I'm Greenie the Animal, and I like oh, this territory. Yeah, well, just check this out. A little head bobbing and dewlap. Uh, oh. oh! Same okay, time each and every week, uncensored episode, and uncut. Okay. No doubt about it, I'm a nature nut. Wait a minute.